Hey everyone, this is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology, and today we are going to take a look at Venus's opposition to Neptune. Yesterday, we talked about Venus trining Uranus as Mercury is stationing and turning direct this week. The other aspect that is happening is an opposition from Venus to Neptune. This is sliding into the week subtly because Venus-Neptune connections are often like that. They can be very subtle, but powerful at the exact same time. Sometimes they're not so subtle, but we're going to talk today about five subtle Venus-Neptune karmas to watch out for because these really can kind of fly underneath the radar um, when these two planets come into contact with one another. This is one of my favorite personal aspects, like Venus-Neptune contacts. I love, I feel like um, some of my favorite social experiences with friends, my favorite like date night or activity, like the fun things my wife and I go and do are often Venus Neptune occasions. So like, I'm always, I feel like the combination is very artistic and fun and um, creative and kind of otherworldly. And uh, it's a really nice contact. So in talking about this today, as always, we're simply looking at one angle of this archetypal combination. We are looking today at some of the problematic, subtle, let's call them karmic traps of Venus-Neptune. But there are other ways of looking at Venus-Neptune as well. And we will be highlighting some of those um, probably tomorrow, I think. I have to finalize a few things on my agenda for this week, but I believe tomorrow we'll be turning this jewel again to look at Venus-Neptune from a slightly different perspective. So just keep that in mind. Anyway, before we get into it, don't forget to like and subscribe. Share your comments if you've got them, if you have reflections to share, if you have this aspect in your natal chart, it'd be interesting to hear your story or your take on this. You can find transcripts of any of these daily talks on the website, nightlightastrology.com. We're trying to get to 70,000 subscribers on the channel so far. We have doubled our monthly subscription average in the past month, so let's keep it up. Thank you, everyone who listens regularly and has chosen to subscribe. If you listen regularly and have not yet subscribed, please consider doing so. It helps us grow the business and the channel and everything else we do. Much appreciated. Uh, head over to nightlightastrology.com because today is the final day of our sale, our pre-sale on the new beginners course. Go up to courses, click on astrology for beginners. The pre-sale ends today, so you have all the way up until midnight. It'll be deactivated tomorrow, and you'll see the normal price there. So you get $50 off today when you enroll. This is an eight-module pre-recorded course, so you can take your time watch it at your own pace. This is for absolute beginners who are looking for a good starting point. Maybe take this before you join our first year course in November. So um, this is, a, I think this is going to be for many people who are just starting and looking for someone to help explain things at a very basic level, kind of put things together, get you a foundational level understanding that you can continue moving forward with in astrology. This is a great course. I've spent a lot of time designing it and creating it myself. So um, really taking into account what I see some of our absolute beginners lacking when they come into our first year program, which is also good for beginners, but it sort of assumes that there are some very, very basic things that, that people know already, uh, most of which people find just by virtue of taking in astrology content, doing a little research on the internet and stuff like that. But this is going to introduce you to planets, signs, houses, aspects, dignities, timing techniques, what astrology is, a little bit of the history also, some advice on horoscopes and astrological content creators and knowing more about what you choose to digest and, and consume, I should say, out there. And also some of the best ways to learn astrology moving forward, including what our courses uh, offer and other ways to keep studying on your own that we recommend. So if you're someone who watches my channel, especially and you're newer to astrology, I think it's really helpful to participate in a lineage. Astrology has always been passed down from practitioners to students who take up the lineage of their teacher in the way that their teacher teaches and does astrology. Um, so one thing we offer at Nightlight that I think is a real benefit is you have a really good, strong, vibrant lineage going with a big community of people who have come through our programs. And, um, and I myself have, of course, participated in the lineages of a few different teachers myself. And it's good to have a few, you know, not just one, but... Anyhow, so check out that sale. It ends today. Today is the last day to take advantage of it. Hope you will. Now let us turn our attention to the real-time clock where we will be looking at Venus opposite Neptune and some subtle karmas to watch for. All right, so here we have Tuesday, August 27th, and Venus is less than two degrees away from the opposition to Neptune. If we fast forward this to tomorrow, Wednesday, August 28th, we're going to see that very quickly these two planets 
move through the opposition. So here is Venus moving through the opposition with Neptune by tomorrow, Wednesday, August 28th in the afternoon. This is Central Time USA. And that will then, if we go forward one more day, we'll see that Venus then transitions into Libra by Thursday, August 29th. So we have just today and tomorrow really to experience this quick moving opposition from Venus to Neptune. You may experience it a little bit as Venus is separating still within three degrees across the sign boundary into Libra, but primarily today and tomorrow. So today what I wanted to do is, you know, every archetypal combination has shadows, traps that we can fall into that often create difficulty, pain, all of which we can learn from, right? But if we know a little bit more, we can also avoid some of these things and move through a uh, an archetypal field with a little bit more awareness or consciousness. Now, sometimes it doesn't matter how much awareness or consciousness we have. As a matter of fate and karma, we're just going to go through some things and learn some things, and we might not be able to avoid any of this. But what we can know, what we can understand is worth thinking about and bringing into our awareness, right? So these are things that I have learned and noticed from Venus-Neptune dynamics, especially in transits to my clients' natal charts over the years, as well as just mundane transits, observations in my own life. And these are the things that I would watch for. Be careful of these things. Maybe tomorrow what we'll do is we'll try to hit some of the more constructive, exciting Venus-Neptune themes so we sort of balance it out. But these are five subtle Venus-Neptune karmas to be aware of. Number one, wishing others harm. Now, on the surface, when you hear that phrase, wishing others harm, I'm sure you, like me, and like most people we all know, would be like, oh, I do not wish other people harm negative. <laughs> we, do, we do not do that, right? But we do. <laughs> and let's be real about it. Most of the ways in which in in which we wish other people harm are very subtle. This is why it's a subtle karma. And it is it is often cloaked in a kind of self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is one of the most pervasive and um difficult things for us to come to terms with. I say that as someone who struggles with it myself. Now, um, wishing other others harm often looks just like this. Okay, and I, I'm making up a story, all right? So this is not coming from anything other than my imagination. Uh, let's say that you, you have a friend, and that friend is in a relationship with someone that isn't good for them. And you can see it. You can see it. And you kind of go, well, you know, I hope she gets a real wake up call from this. You know, I hope she, I hope, I hope this teaches her a lesson. On the one hand, you could almost say that what you're really hoping for is that they learn and grow. And how noble of you, how noble of me to wish that someone <laughs> would learn and grow by, okay, why don't you graduate beyond shitty relationship school? I hope this teaches you a lesson. But the thing is, is that when we involve ourselves in other people's karma, and we subtly think to ourselves, I know what they need. I know what would be best for them. I know what they don't know. And God, I wish they'd learn. I wish they'd get a little karmic education. That is subtly, subtly, a kind of, a kind of violent posture. And it the, the way that we entangle ourselves in relationships with other people is not merely through the time we spend, the intimacy we share, the friendship, the connection. It's also... The relationships we have with other people are often based in enmity or spite. Our connections with other people are often based on our judgments and opinions of other people. Those are also a form of bond. It's 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 like bondage, right? But it's a kind of bond. Opinions about other people bind us to them, karmically speaking. And that's something that goes way back. I mean, that is at the core of what I learned from some of the most sacred, beautiful wisdom texts of the yogic tradition. And obviously this is at work in the way that a lot of people have thought about fate from all different places around the planet over thousands of years, right? Don't dwell on what other people are getting right or wrong. And, you know, here's another thing. When we watch the news, right? And I'm, I really don't watch the news much anymore. I have to protect my serenity. But um, at any rate, whether you do or don't is not the point. The simple point is that when we watch the news, we often see the missteps that other people are taking. 
And as soon as we do and we develop opinion about, ooh, well, I bet, I hope that person gets what's coming to them. I hope justice serves them well. I hope that they they get corrected somehow. Um, this entangles us in another person's karma. There is a, anytime we have like punitive thoughts about other people, my own kids, for God's sake, I'll be like, you know, well, I hope my daughter learns by doing this stupid thing that I've told her not to do, <laughs> you know, that will result in her, you know, uh, hurting herself or something. I, I hope that little bugger gets a lesson, you know, but this kind of thinking subtly, even if it's pretty benign, still subtly, it is entangling us in the karma of someone else. And it is a kind of bondage. The thing that we don't realize about Venus time and time again is that Venus forms relationships with people that are rooted in what we don't like as much as what we do. And we always have to be aware of how we are being attracted into um, dynamics with other human beings based on how loudly we allow our dislikes, disapproval, disapproval, judgments and opinions about what other people are doing wrong or getting wrong to, uh, to cloud us and to entangle us. It's not saying that having an opinion is a crime, but it's like every time that we have a, an opinion about what someone else ought to be experiencing, you know, well, I, I don't like the way that this content creator makes their stuff. I don't like their tone. I don't like their attitude, you know, and eventually I'm sure they're going to, they're, they're going to lose followers and get what's coming to them. You know, th this kind of thing. Um, those are tempting thoughts, by the way, though, like I find myself sometimes when I'm, I don't know, scrolling around and finding some kind of astrological content creation that I find to be subpar in some way. Well, who, 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 why are my opinions so valuable, right? Who cares that I'll be like, uh, you know, it's so sad that this person has more followers than I do. And, um, you know, eventually something will happen to like correct the ego in that person's presentation. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just being totally transparent here. I don't think these things often because I've learned and I'm in the process of continuing to learn the same lesson. Don't do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> just let other people stay in your own lane. That's something we say at Al-Anon. Stay in your own lane. So there's a subtle way in which we look at other people and we kind of play the karmic judge. And it's often in these very, very subtle, simple ways that we think are benign. No, it's just my opinion. I, you know, oh, Rachel, God, you know, she's going to eventually get type two diabetes. But I mean, at least that'll serve her to, uh, you know, ser serve her some lesson and help her finally get real about her health. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's funny how, um, like, that there's often a just like a little like a little inner what am i thinking of like simon cowell you know from the uh oh, what what show is american idol there's like a little panel of judges and i think a lot of them try to be fair minded you know and kind and compassionate and then there's like one on our inner committee <laughs> who's like this person ought to get this or that that's a subtle neptune venus karma that actually entangles us with other people's karma. So if you think someone else is mad, let me give you a simple example. <clears throat> Actually, I'll come back to this with a later example. All right, let's keep going. Number two, desiring what others have. This is also subtle and pervasive. See, one of the problems is that if I'm, if now I, I promise you, I do not do this on the regular, but if I were to be scrolling through and saying, oh, that's so sad that this person that I think I don't like their content. I don't think they should have so many followers. I don't think they should be as successful as, as I am, or I should be more successful or something like that. There's a subtle way in which I just want what somebody else has. And then I try to form opinions about why they're not deserving of what they have, which is actually cloaking the fact that I just desire what they have, right? This is a lesson that we're always learning. I mean, it's so simple. It's something we learn when we're kids, you know, sort of like that basic, don't covet, don't be jealous, don't desire what other people have, just kind of stay in your own lane, try to be content with what you are and what you have, and try to really be content in who you are and what you have, like to really sink into it and be glad, you know, be happy. 
So when we desire what others have, whether it's their body or their health or their followers or their wealth or their uh, their their healthy relationship or their whatever, anything, there's a difference between saying, I am inspired by the way that someone lives their life, by the choices they make, and they embody something of a leader to me. And I admire that. And so I'm going to emulate that good quality. I think that is beautiful. And that's a good way to desire what someone else has, because really what we're desiring is the light within ourselves to be amplified because we're seeing it in someone else. So that's beautiful. There's a difference between that and usually the jealousy is connecting to the desire for what others have. And this is a very pervasive Venus-Neptune dynamic. I want what that person has. I want something that I can't have or that's forbidden or that... Um, yeah, or that uh, there's a there's a way in which, in other words, we're comparing ourselves to other people. <clears throat> now, another one, number three, is forming opinions about what others lack. We can also very easily have this kind of charitable form of judgment that <laughs> when we 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 it kind of it flies under the radar because we think it's a voice of charity. Oh, if only that person knew this, if only that person would eat right, if only that person knew how to do this, if only this person had that. And we we think to ourselves, well, I know what someone else needs. I know exactly what someone else needs. And so when we sit around thinking, well, gosh, I feel bad for this person because they just need this or that and they just they don't have it, they don't know it, you know, we have to be really careful of that because there's a, a, a kind of like a basic mantra that we should remember with this Venus Neptune karma, which is we have no idea what other people need. Like for the most part, and I'm not saying there aren't like very practical, basic situations. You're a parent, you know, your kid needs food. You know, there's ways in which we know what each other need and we tend to each other's needs. I'm talking about when we stand in judgment and we say, oh, this person needs this, this person needs that. I know what they need. Really, you know? <laughs> I think there's a a kind of there's a baseline mantra that many different spiritual traditions say which is I don't know enough to know what I need so dear universe please guide me in helping me know what I need and if that's a prayer for ourselves then how much more should it be something that we apply to our basic understanding of another soul that we are not we don't live in another person's soul. We don't know what it's like. Every soul is so unique. Every soul story, soul history, every soul's relationship with the divine, every way in which each path has been crafted and is being perfectly designed by... No, we don't know. We don't know what someone needs. We might have a very basic idea about what they need, but most of the time, those ideas about what someone else needs are going to entangle us again in difficult karma. It's better to say, gosh, well, if only my if only my brother would learn to uh if only he could learn to eat healthier, he'd lose that weight. If only my brother could learn learn to eat, he he just he just needs some self-control. What if instead we started with dear universe, I have opinions and judgments and thoughts and worries and frustration with my brother. Please take care of him because I don't know what's best for him, but I trust that his guides and the universe does. So I hand that concern over rather than staying in the prison of my opinions in my sense of judgment, in my sense of rightness. You know, it's just like that simple. Like we got to hand it back over. And let me tell you, I'm for real when I say this, the, the reason I'm sitting here talking about this is not because I've got it mastered. It's because this is what I have to do for myself. And these are the things that I notice around Venus-Neptune dynamics. Number four, and they get really amplified, by the way. I mean, they can become like soap, soap opera level when Venus or Neptune is transiting natal Venus in your birth chart, by the way. So watch for that. But anyhow, number four is being the right or helpful one in relationships. There is a way in which we also tend to enter and exist within relationships based on the feeling of needing to be right and helpful. I know what's right. I can be the helpful one 
But because I know what's right and because I'm in possession of all of the right things and ingredients, um, then I will maintain a sense of that rightness and feel very good about myself by constantly being in the role of helper for this person. Now, obviously, this is the basis of many codependent types of relationships, right? But it is very important to note that these kinds of relationships often form or dissolve under contacts from transiting Neptune to Venus in the birth chart. You will find that codependent dynamics wherein you feel like you need to be the helper, the savior, the one who I have what you need, I can help, I can be of benefit and service like this. But often it is exactly that attitude that keeps us entangled in relationships that are ultimately not so healthy for us. Um, does that mean there's no room to be a helper, a servant, a, ca a care provider? No, of course, there's plenty of room for that. We're talking about a very specific type of Venus-Neptune dynamic wherein we maintain a sense of our value or our validity by knowing what is right and by being helpful to people who are lost. This is why there is something like the, the, the martyr or saint complex with Venus Neptune that often shows up and Neptune dynamics in general can bring this into other planets as well, but something to watch for because it's so subtle, right? It's so easy to think that we're doing the right thing because we've got the right knowledge, the right information, and I just want to help. But when there's this, this subtle form of, um, I know best, I know better. Um, and it's, it is subtle. It will hide. So you have to watch for it and be careful of it. We think it's all or nothing. So sometimes people hear something like this and they think, well, you're saying there's no room to ever be helpful. Or there's no room to ever, like, doesn't a healthcare provider know what's best for their clients and use that knowledge to help them? Of course. But there's a difference between that and, you know, uh, whatever, like Aunt Shireen, who says, like, I'm going to help every single person. And I have this. <laughs> Sorry, I just realized this Shireen. That's a great name. I don't know where I came up with that one. Anyway, she knows. She knows better. She knows best. She'll be the right one. She'll be the helpful one. This is, there are actually in alcoholic families in the literature of 12 step programs of action, not just alcoholism, but in families with addiction, in general, there are often, there will often be constellated within that dynamic, a person who plays this role. And it is a part of the complex. And this person will often require change and growth and healing as much as the actual addict, right? Who's constantly receiving the help. So anyway, you guys, I, you guys are all smart enough to know what I'm talking about. I know, I know you guys know this. All right, number five, elevating and demoting people in cycles. This is another very Venus Neptune thing. Oh my God, this person is amazing. This is the best person ever. I'm in love with them. They're so fantastic. They're so inspired. They're so spiritual. They're so wonderful. And then a fault or a flaw arises, or they disappoint you. Um, right? Oh, give me. I'll give you an example. I'll just be really real here. Over the years, here's a very simple pattern that happens to me at least a couple times a year. Someone on social media somewhere who uh, enjoys the content on the channel will send in a very, very, very long letter. And it's uh, this is always how I know. It's like, oh, we're going to this pattern. Okay. And the letter will basically be like, you know, you're my guru. You're my whatever. Some, some kind of exaltation. Wow. Really hard not to like... Ooh, you know, I <laughs> could get high on that one. Oh, that was really nice. 17 pages of glory, you know, or, <laughs> or whatever. And then when I don't have the time to respond, if I say, thank you so much for your letter. Gosh, I'm so glad you're getting so much out of the channel. Please stay in touch. Let me know how things go, right? Because I have a million things I'm doing and I don't have time to respond to a 17 page letter. Then the person will say, ah, <laughs> right? You've disappointed my expectation. I was thinking you were really going to engage with me in this really lengthy, long way and, you know, pay attention to the three pages in the middle where I talked about my Aunt Shireen or whatever it might be. <laughs> and you don't. And so then mm, you're, it looks like you're imperfect. And then you get a 17 page letter telling you that you're slime, you know? Okay. And that's a, that's kind of exaggerated. I don't really get 17 pages, but you, you get the idea. And this happens to not just myself, by the way, I have like other content creator friends where we have like a little, we have private threads where we share and commiserate with this kind of dynamic, which is part of being in a public platform where some people 
will just react this way because it's a human thing to do to put someone on a platform only to swipe them off from it. This is very Venus Neptune. Venus Neptune can fall in love with something about somebody, but then there'll be a fault or a flaw. And that fault or flaw will then be the grounds to completely demote them. And not only that, but usually degrade. So exaltation and fall are opposites in ancient astrology. Think about Venus in Pisces, exalted. Think about Venus in Virgo in fall or any of the other planets. That cycle is familiar. Things get lifted up on high and then like a cup of water, they're poured out. So one of the things you have to be really careful of is what do you exalt? With Venus and Neptune, the tendency is that whatever you exalt will eventually disappoint you. And so you have to be like, there's like a, a kind of a temperance. That's the word I'm looking for. Like a temperance that we carry with Venus, Neptune, so that we say, that's beautiful. I love that. I'm really attracted to that. And I'm sure it's humid and I'm sure there'll be shortcomings. And I'm sure that it's, you know, I'm seeing it right now through the lens of my excitement or, or my infatuation. It's not wrong to have exalted feelings. It's wrong to take them so literally that you can't understand them as like an energetic, like, like a weather system that's moving through and that won't last forever. So be careful of greatly exalting people because the, the likelihood is that you, you've done so at the cost of valuing yourself in some way. Like when we exalt people, there's a very subtle way in which we are often comparing ourselves to them. And then in order to take some kind of dignity back, we have to swipe them off the pedestal we've put them on, right? That's a crazy, kind of a crazy thing to do if you think about it. So <laughs> anyway, but we do this. I would say the number one lesson that I've ever received in my life about this came when I went through, and you guys, most of you who follow my channel for a while have seen me go through this. I went through a period of time where I uh, studied with and took vows with a guru. And I did that with a guru, which is kind of part of what gurus are and what you're sort of like supposed to do. But it got wrapped up for me in some, um, well, I was raised a preacher's kid. And so the role of like spiritual leader and parent are, that have been like a, like complicated for me. And a lot of learning happened around that dynamic. And the basic thing that I'm trying to say is that to the extent that we put someone up on a platform, there's often a way in which we are degrading ourselves at the exact same time and we don't even realize it. And then if we want to get something of our own value back, it's like we have to take them off the platform somehow. Thankfully, when it came to my relationship with my guru and I realized all of this was happening, I was able to, because it wasn't so severe, I was able to talk to him about this and part ways with that tradition and with his formal presence in my life in a way that was really healthy and um, honest. And, and like, I'm very, very grateful for that. If I look back on earlier times in my life, more complicated dynamics. I remember there was a shaman that I worked with in the ayahuasca realm where I did that and then had to sort of take this person off the pedestal I had put them on. And it was a lot more turbulent because I was in a much more turbulent space, right? And so this is very human. We do these things. It's not, I'm not trying to, um, you know, call out people in a way that I wouldn't do for myself, right? But Venus Neptune will have us glorifying things only to become disappointed, you know, like, the princess and the pea kind of thing. It's like there's a small thing we find and it gives us a reason to swipe them off the thing we've put them on. Be careful of that dynamic. So anyway, these are five subtle Venus Neptune karmas. I hope you find them useful. If nothing else, part of what you're always getting on this channel is education about archetypes. So now you can take this forward into and apply with all Venus Neptune dynamics that you ever work with. And um, that's what we ought to be doing. We ought to be constantly learning new things about archetypal combinations. So on that note, I think we'll come back tomorrow and do more on Venus Neptune. We'll turn it and have a little bit more fun and look at the, uh, you know, I'd say the more exciting dimensions of Venus Neptune because today might have, you know, it might have felt like a, a little bit of a bummer. Uh, <clears throat> but that's okay. I know just what you need and I'm here to help with my super excited happy video tomorrow. <laughs> All right, bye.